Bloodstained clock strikes. The village of Brackenwood had always been shrouded in rumors. Nestled deep within the forest, it was a place where nature and the supernatural seemed to coexist. But no place was as feared as the old Blackwood Manor. Perched atop a hill like a sentinel over the village, the manor had stood abandoned for decades. Its windows shattered, its once grand walls covered in thick vines, and at its heart, a peculiar clock tower that hadn't chimed in years. Local legend claimed that when the clock struck midnight, something terrible would happen. But no one had heard it ring. Not since that fateful night 50 years ago when the entire Blackwood family mysteriously vanished, leaving behind only bloodstains splattered across the hands of the clock. For decades, the villagers steered clear of the place. Children whispered about ghosts, and the elders warned of cursed spirits that wandered the halls. But for Evelyn, an investigative journalist, it was just a story waiting to be unraveled. Evelyn had been sent to Brackenwood by her editor. Get the truth behind the Blackwood legend, he had said, and she eagerly the challenge. She didn't believe in curses or haunted mansions. In her mind, every mystery had a logical explanation, and she was determined to uncover it. With a flashlight in hand and a tape recorder in her pocket, Evelyn trekked up the hill as the sky turned a bruised purple, signaling the onset of evening. The manor loomed ahead, casting an ominous shadow on the overgrown path. As she approached the front doors, she felt a strange twinge of hesitation. The air seemed heavier, as if the place was alive and watching her. Brushing off the feeling, she pushed the creaky door open and stepped inside. Dust coated every surface, and the faint smell of decay lingered in the air. Evelyn scanned the grand foyer with its decaying furniture and peeling wallpaper, her eyes drawn to the towering clock in the center of the room. Its hands were frozen at 11.55. The faintest stain of crimson could still be seen smeared across the clock's glass, barely visible under the layers of dust and grime. Pulling out her tape recorder, she spoke into it. The clock hasn't moved in 50 years. Its hands are stopped just before midnight. This is where the legend begins. Evelyn's voice echoed eerily in the vast empty space. She made her way through the manor, searching for clues. There was an unnatural stillness to the place. Even the wind seemed afraid to enter. Hours passed, and as the sun set fully, casting the manor in darkness, Evelyn began to feel a prickling sensation at the back of her neck. Shadows seemed to shift in the corners of her vision, and strange noises echoed faintly through the halls. Scratches, whispers, footsteps. Yet every time she spun around, there was nothing. It wasn't until she entered the drawing room that she found something truly chilling. An old family portrait hung crooked on the wall. It depicted the Blackwood family, parents, children, all standing stiffly. But something was wrong. Their faces seemed distorted, as if the paint had been smeared. And in the background of the painting, the clock loomed, its hands blurred. Evelyn felt a sudden cold breeze. She shivered, pulling her jacket tighter around her. The air in the room grew dense with an oppressive energy. Just then, a sound shattered the silence. Ding! Ding! It was faint but unmistakable, the toll of the clock. She glanced at her wristwatch. It was exactly 11.55. Impossible. The clock hadn't worked in years, and yet she could hear it. Heart racing, Evelyn rushed back to the foyer. The hands of the clock remained still, yet the eerie chime continued. Ding! Ding! The hairs on the back of her neck stood up. The clock was counting down. To what? She tried to rationalize it. Maybe an old mechanism had suddenly triggered, but deep down a sickening fear began to grip her. Suddenly, from the corner of her eye, Evelyn saw a flicker of movement. She froze. Standing in the shadows near the stairwell was a figure, her breath caught in her throat. It was a man, or rather, the ghost of one. His eyes were sunken, his skin pale and bloodied. He stared at her unblinking, his mouth twisted into a grotesque smile. Then, behind him, another figure appeared, a woman this time. Blood trickled from her eyes, and then another. A child, his hands stained red, the Blackwood family. Evelyn stumbled back, her mind reeling. This couldn't be happening. She wasn't a believer in ghosts, in curses. But there they were, staring at her with hollow eyes, silently advancing. The clock struck again, louder this time. Ding! Ding! 11.58. Evelyn turned and ran, her footsteps echoing as she raced through the manor. 
Every corridor seemed to stretch on endlessly, as if the house itself was trapping her, pulling her deeper into its cursed heart. As she rounded a corner, she saw it. The clock's gears were moving, slowly, methodically, ticking down to midnight. Blood now dripped from the hands, staining the face of the clock. The figures were closing in, their footsteps now audible behind her. She could feel their presence, cold and oppressive. With every toll of the clock, their whispers grew louder. Desperate, Evelyn ran to the front door and pulled at the handle, but it wouldn't budge. She was trapped. Twen. A deafening silence followed. The clock had struck midnight. Suddenly, Evelyn felt a hand on her shoulder. Cold fingers gripped her tightly, and as she turned around, she came face to face with the Blackwood family once again. Their eyes bore into hers, filled with sorrow and anger. Before she could scream, everything went black. The next morning, the villagers found the door to Blackwood Manor ajar. Inside, there was no sign of Evelyn, but there, standing ominously in the center of the foyer, was the clock. Its hands were now frozen at twelve, and splattered across the glass was a fresh smear of blood. Story number two. Forgotten Morgue Patient The rain drummed relentlessly on the old hospital's windows as Dr. Rachel Mills sat in her small office, buried beneath a mountain of paperwork. St. Alaric Hospital had a reputation, but it wasn't a good one. Once a renowned center for medical research, it was now just a crumbling relic, a place for the forgotten. Rachel had only been working here for six months, assigned to the morgue department, an area no one ever wanted to visit. The basement, where the morgue was located, was particularly dreadful. The constant hum of the old ventilation system gave the impression that something was always alive down there. It was a place where time stood still, and the air was heavy with the unsettling feeling that the dead weren't entirely resting. On this night, as the rain poured outside, Rachel received a call. Dr. Mills, we've got another one for you. Unidentified, body was found near the old Elm Street Cemetery. Her heart sank. Another one. She sighed, grabbed her coat, and made her way to the elevator that led to the basement. The ride down felt eternal, and the moment the doors opened, the familiar scent of cold steel and chemicals hit her. The lights in the morgue flickered occasionally, casting eerie shadows on the walls. Rachel always had a strange feeling about this place, as though she wasn't alone. She unlocked the cold storage unit and slid the latest arrival onto the metal table. The corpse was covered with a white sheet. The air seemed to grow colder as she prepared to perform the initial examination. Pulling back the sheet, Rachel froze. The body on the table was that of an old man, his face twisted in a grotesque expression of fear. His hands were curled into claws as if he had fought something or someone in his last moments. His eyes, though clouded with death, seemed wide as if they'd witnessed something unspeakable. Something about this man was unsettling. His skin was pale, almost translucent, and his hair thin and brittle. She couldn't shake the feeling that he looked familiar. A chill ran down her spine. It wasn't the first time she had felt that way. There had been whispers about the hospital for years, stories of strange happenings in the morgue, bodies moving on their own, voices in the dark. Rachel had always dismissed them as local folklore, the kind of tales told to frighten newcomers. But tonight, standing over this corpse, she wasn't so sure. She grabbed her recorder and began documenting the body's features. Male, approximately 70 years old, cause of death, unknown. Her voice faltered as she examined the man's chest. There were no visible signs of trauma. No stab wounds, no gunshot marks, nothing. It was as if he had simply died from sheer terror. As she reached for the man's wrist to check for any hidden injuries, she noticed something strange. His wrist was branded with a small circular scar, almost like a burn mark. It was faint, but it stood out against his pallid skin. Rachel frowned. She had seen this mark before, on another patient, months ago. The memory hit her like a cold wave. Six months prior, the first time she had examined a body here, she had noticed the same mark. Back then, it had been a younger man he liked, found under similar circumstances near the cemetery. No cause of death, no explanation, just the same twisted expression of fear. Rachel's heart raced as she quickly checked the records. Her hands trembled as she found the file from that case. There it was, the same mark, the same expression, the same inexplicable death. But something was even more disturbing. The date on the old file, the younger man had died exactly 50 years ago to the day. 
A cold sweat formed on her brow as she looked back at the body on the table. The old man. His face twisted in terror, his eyes seemingly pleading for release. Rachel's breath quickened, her rational mind grappling with the growing sense of dread. Suddenly, the lights flickered again. The temperature in the room dropped sharply, and the familiar hum of the ventilation system seemed to warp into a low, guttural groan. The sound of footsteps echoed faintly from the far end of the morgue. Rachel whipped her head around, but there was no one there. The shadows seemed to lengthen, creeping closer to her. She heard it then, a faint whisper. Help me. Her blood ran cold. It wasn't possible. The morgue was sealed. No one was down here except her. But the whisper persisted, growing louder, more desperate. Help me. Find him. Rachel stumbled back, her eyes darting to the body on the table. The old man's mouth was slightly open, and for a brief moment she thought she saw his lips move. Panic surged through her. She turned to leave, but something stopped her. A movement, a shift in the shadows. Her eyes fell on the cold storage units lining the walls. One drawer in particular was slightly ajar. It hadn't been that way when she arrived. Trembling, Rachel approached it. She placed her hand on the handle and hesitated, every instinct screaming at her to run. But she couldn't leave, not without knowing. She pulled the drawer open. Inside lay another body, but this one was different. It was fresh, untouched by the decay of time. A young man, his features eerily similar to the one on the table, and on his wrist, the same mark. Suddenly, the truth hit her like a freight train. The old man wasn't just another victim. He was the same person. He had been found 50 years ago, and somehow he had aged. His body returned to the morgue, that, but his soul was trapped, unable to find peace. The whispers grew louder, more insistent. Find him, before it's too late. Rachel backed away, her heart thudding in her chest. The morgue seemed to close in around her, the walls pressing in, suffocating her. And then the whisper stopped. The lights flickered one last time, and everything fell silent. But the old man's eyes, they were still open, staring directly at her, and she could swear he was smiling. That night, Rachel quit her job. No one ever saw her again. And the morgue? The old man was never accounted for. Story number three. Abandoned nurse's call. In a remote town nestled deep in the woods, there stood an old abandoned hospital. Locals whispered stories of the strange occurrences that had happened there in the 1960s when it was operational. Nurses claimed they heard faint whispers through the walls, saw flickering lights in empty rooms, and sometimes found patients in different beds than they had been assigned. But the, but the strangest of all was Nurse Margot, who disappeared without a trace one cold November night. Her vanishing had closed the hospital's doors forever. Now, over 50 years later, the hospital remained empty, crumbling, and forgotten, except for those curious enough to explore its decaying halls. Leah and her friends were just such curious souls. It was a chilly October night, and the group of four had heard about the hospital's haunted reputation. They didn't believe in ghosts, of course. Ghosts were for children. But the thrill of exploring something abandoned and untouched for decades had an undeniable pull. Come on, it's just a bunch of old walls. What's the worst that can happen? Leah's friend, Eric, joked as they stood at the hospital's entrance, the rusty sign reading Northridge Hospital swaying ominously in the wind. I don't know. It's creepy, said Tara, the quietest of the group. Her voice trembled slightly. My grandma told me a story about this place. She said some people think Margot still works here on the night shift. Oh, come on. That's just a campfire story, Leah said, rolling her eyes, but there was a chill creeping up her spine that she couldn't shake. The idea of a lost nurse still roaming the halls was unsettling. With flashlights in hand, they stepped inside. The floor creaked beneath their feet as they made their way through the peeling, paint-scarred corridors. The air was thick with the smell of mold and decay. Cobwebs stretched like silken veins across every doorway. Suddenly, Leah's phone buzzed in her pocket. She pulled it out and stared at the screen. Unknown caller. The others stopped, looking at her quizzically. You gonna answer that? Eric asked. Leah hesitated. Who the hell would be calling me here? She let it ring for a moment longer, then declined the call. Probably just a glitch. No reception out here anyway. They ventured deeper, laughing nervously at their own spooked imaginations. But as they turned a corner into what looked like an old nursing station, Leah's phone buzzed again. Same number. Unknown caller. 
Leah's fingers shook as she swiped to decline once more. Okay, that's starting to freak me out. Let's keep moving, Tara whispered, her eyes darting around. They turned down another hallway, this one leading to the old patient rooms. The walls seemed to close in, the darkness pressing against the small beam of their flashlights. Then, without warning, Leah's phone rang again. But this time, when she looked at the screen, the name Nurse Margot flashed across it. Her heart skipped a beat. Okay, this isn't funny, Leah stammered. Who's messing with my phone? That's not us, Leah, Eric said, his voice cracking slightly. Answer it, Tara whispered, her eyes wide. Leah hesitated, then pressed the green button. She lifted the phone to her ear, but there was no sound on the other end, just a low, static hum, like the crackle of an old radio. Hello? Leah said, her voice barely above a whisper. The static intensified. Then, through the interference, she heard it. A faint voice. A woman's voice, almost too soft to hear, but clear enough to chill her blood. Help me! Leah's throat tightened and she pulled the phone away from her ear. The others stared at her, their faces pale in the dim light. What did you hear? Eric asked. She, she said, help me. Suddenly, the hospital seemed alive with sound. A distant hum like the flicker of old fluorescent lights buzzed through the corridors. The temperature dropped and their breath became visible in the frigid air. Leah's phone vibrated again. A message. Room 306. Now. Leah felt her legs turn to lead. She knew she didn't want to go there, but something, some unseen force, was pulling her forward. The others followed reluctantly, their faces drawn tight with fear. They found room 306 near the end of the hall. The door was ajar, creaking slightly as it swayed back and forth. Leah reached out and pushed it open. Inside, the room was eerily untouched. The bed was neatly made, medical equipment arranged as if a patient had just left. But there was something on the bed that made Leah's heart drop. A single, old-fashioned nurse's cap, stained yellow with age. Then Tara screamed. Look! The dusty old telephone in the corner of the room, the one that hadn't been used in decades, was ringing. Its shrill sound cut through the silence, echoing through the walls. Leah, unable to resist, picked up the receiver with trembling fingers. Hello? A breathy voice answered, barely audible, but unmistakably real. Help me. They won't let me leave. The line went dead. Panic surged through Leah's veins. We need to get out of here, she yelled, turning to run. But as they rushed down the hall, something strange happened. The hospital began to change. The peeling wallpaper seemed to repair itself, the air filling with the sterile scent of disinfectant. The halls grew brighter, illuminated by functioning lights, and then they saw her. At the end of the corridor stood Nurse Margot, her face obscured by shadows, but her presence undeniable. She was dressed in a crisp white uniform, her posture unnaturally still. Slowly, she lifted a hand, beckoning them closer. Leah, no, Tara shouted, but Leah was transfixed. Margot's eyes locked with hers, dark, hollow, and filled with endless sorrow. Suddenly, everything shifted. The hospital crumbled back into decay, the lights flickered and died, and the figure vanished. Leah's phone buzzed again. She looked down, and the screen displayed a final message. Thank you for answering the call. The group fled the hospital, their hearts pounding in their chests. When they finally reached the car, Leah looked back at the dark silhouette of the building. The phone never rang again. But deep in her bones, Leah knew something had changed. She had answered the abandoned nurse's call. And now, she would never be free. Story number four. Unknown ring. The evening settled over the town of Maple Ridge, the streets slowly darkening under the fading sunlight. Lucy stepped out of her car, shutting the door behind her with a soft click. She glanced around the quiet cul-de-sac, taking in the peaceful houses with their drawn curtains and empty driveways. This was her new home, far from the bustle of the city, and more importantly, far from the memories she was trying to escape. It had been a long year. After the sudden death of her husband, Greg, Lucy needed a fresh start. She had chosen this place for its stillness, its isolation, a small town where nothing exciting happened, where she could heal and rebuild her life. But as she stood on her porch, fumbling with her keys, she couldn't shake the gnawing sensation of unease that had crept up on her over the past few days. Inside, the house was cold. She flipped on the lights, illuminating the sparsely furnished rooms and inside. Unpacking had been slow. She wasn't in a hurry to settle in. 
the empty spaces felt appropriate for her state of mind. As she wandered into the kitchen, she noticed the landline phone sitting on the counter, untouched since she moved in. No one ever called her on that phone. Her friends and family reached her on her mobile, and the house phone was an outdated relic left by the previous owners. She considered getting rid of it, but something about the old rotary dial amused her. It gave the house character, she thought. Lucy poured herself a glass of wine and sank into the worn couch, turning on the TV to fill the silence. The low hum of a sitcom played in the background, and she let herself relax for the first time that day. Suddenly, the phone rang. Lucy's head snapped toward the kitchen. The shrill sound cut through the air like a blade, its high-pitched ring out of place in the quiet house. She hesitated, staring at the phone from her spot on the couch. Who could possibly be calling? Her heart began to race. She didn't know anyone here, and no one knew the number. For a moment, she considered letting it ring, but something compelled her to answer. Maybe it was a neighbor, she thought, or a wrong number. She crossed the room, feeling a strange sense of dread crawling up her spine. The phone continued to ring, a relentless, piercing sound. Her hand hovered over the receiver before she finally picked it up. Hello? Silence greeted her on the other end. For several seconds, there was nothing but a low, crackling static. Then, faintly, she heard a voice. Lucy. Her breath caught in her throat. She nearly dropped the phone, her heart thudding in her chest. Who is this? She demanded, trying to keep the fear out of her voice. Lucy. The voice was soft, distant, but unmistakable. It sounded like Greg. She slammed the phone down, her hands trembling. The room suddenly felt colder, the air heavy with something she couldn't explain. She backed away from the phone, staring at it as if it might ring again. It didn't. For the rest of the night, she couldn't shake the feeling that she wasn't alone. Every creak of the house, every whisper of the wind outside, felt like someone, or something, was watching her. She double-checked the locks on the doors and windows, but it did little to calm her nerves. By the time she went to bed, she was exhausted, but sleep didn't come easily. A few days passed, and Lucy tried to convince herself that it had been a prank, maybe a mistake. But the thought of hearing Greg's voice again kept gnawing at her. She had buried him months ago. He was gone. Yet the phone rang again. She had just come home from the grocery store when it happened, the phone's sharp ring echoing through the house. Her heart skipped a beat, but this time she was determined to face it. She snatched up the receiver, her voice trembling with anger and fear. Who is this? Stop calling me. Again, there was a pause, static, and then softly, the voice returned. Lucy, it's cold. Her blood ran cold. It wasn't just the words, it was the tone. She knew that voice. It was Greg's. She remembered how he would say those exact words after getting into bed on cold winter nights, but that was impossible. Whoever this is, stop, she yelled, slamming the phone down. She stared at the phone, her heart pounding in her chest. It wasn't possible. Greg was gone. But if it wasn't him, then who or what was calling? Desperate for answers, she did some research on the house. She hadn't paid much attention to its history when she first bought it, eager to escape her past. But now, she needed to know. As she delved into Old Town Records, a chilling discovery came to light. The previous owners had lost their son in a tragic accident, a drowning. His name was also Greg. Lucy's blood turned to ice. The parallels were too eerie to ignore. She found an old photo of the boy, and while he looked nothing like her, Greg, the name, the voice on the phone, that night, the phone rang again. She picked it up slowly, dreading what she would hear. Lucy, it's cold here. Her hands shook. What do you want from me? She whispered, her voice barely audible. There was a long pause before the voice responded. I'm not him. The line went dead. Lucy stared at the phone, her mind racing. The voice was not her Greg. It was something else, something tied to this house, to the boy who had died here. But why was it calling her? Why now? She never found out. The phone never rang again after that night, but the house no longer felt like her own. Every shadow, every creak reminded her that something unseen still lingered. She moved out a month later. As Lucy drove away from the quiet cul-de-sac for the last time, she heard a familiar sound, her mobile phone ringing from the passenger seat. Story number five. Shattered mirror reflections. The town of Ravenscroft was quaint, old, and quiet. 
nestled among thick woods, its cobblestone streets echoed under the boots of townsfolk, and time seemed to have passed it by. People lived simple lives there, until they didn't. One stormy night, as thunder rattled the windows and the wind howled through the cracks, a family moved into the dilapidated mansion on the outskirts of town. The estate had long been abandoned, its windows boarded up and its doors nailed shut, yet something about it drew the Harper family in. They were eager for a fresh start, and the price had been impossible to resist. Clara Harper, the youngest of the family, was curious from the moment they arrived. There was something about the house that pulled at her. The creaking floors, the peeling wallpaper, and the drafty hallways only fueled her imagination. But it wasn't until she found the mirror that everything changed. The mirror was enormous, taking up an entire wall in the dusty attic. It was a gothic relic framed in blackened silver, adorned with intricate carvings of twisted faces and writhing serpents. Despite its age, the glass was pristine, clear as water. Clara's breath hitched when she saw her reflection as if the mirror looked back with more intensity than mere glass should. That night, as she lay in her bed, Clara couldn't shake the feeling of being watched. Her dreams were filled with distorted reflections of herself, her face twisting and contorting into hideous expressions. She woke in a cold sweat, her heart pounding. When she glanced across the room, she gasped. The reflection in her bedroom mirror was wrong. Her reflection smiled, though Clara hadn't. Mom? Dad! Clara's voice trembled as she bolted downstairs to find her parents. Her mother, Rebecca, and father, Mark, looked up from their unpacking, alarmed by the fear in her voice. What's wrong, sweetie? Rebecca asked, reaching out to her. Clara hesitated, unsure how to explain what she had seen. The mirror, my reflection, it moved, but I didn't. Mark gave a gentle chuckle, brushing it off. This old house is playing tricks on your mind, kiddo, probably just a dream. But Clara wasn't convinced. Something about the house, and especially the mirror, felt alive. The next day, Clara returned to the attic. The mirror seemed to call to her, whispering her name in the silence of the house. Standing before it, she stared deeply into her own reflection. Slowly, she raised her hand, and the reflection followed, almost too perfectly. Clara? The voice was soft, like a breath on her ear. She spun around, but the attic was empty. When she turned back to the mirror, her reflection was still there, but her eyes, her eyes were not her own. They were cold, dark, and filled with something sinister. She stumbled backward, tripping over a stack of old boxes. The reflection grinned, a grin so wide it shouldn't have been possible. It mouthed something, but no sound came out. In a panic, Clara ran out of the attic, slamming the door behind her. Days passed and things grew worse. Clara's reflection became more independent, its movements no longer mirroring her own. At first, it was subtle, her reflection lingering for just a moment too long after she had moved. But soon, it became blatant. The reflection would stand still while she moved, watching her with those same cold, dark eyes. And then, the grinning began. That terrible, unnatural grin that filled Clara with dread. Clara tried to tell her parents again, but they dismissed her fears. Her mother grew distant, seemingly absorbed by the house itself. And her father was constantly in a daze, like consumed with fixing up the crumbling structure. No one believed her, no one could see what she saw. Desperate, Clara researched the house's history. The mansion, she learned, once belonged to a wealthy man named Aldous Blackwell, who had been obsessed with mirrors. According to the townspeople, Blackwell believed that mirrors were gateways to other worlds, worlds where the reflections were alive, waiting to take the place of those in this one. He had gone mad, smashing every mirror in the house, save for one, the one Clara had found in the attic. Legend had it that anyone who stared too long into that mirror risked being pulled into the reflections world, where their double would take their place in the real one. The townsfolk called it the curse of the shattered mirror. That night, Clara decided to confront the mirror once and for all. She stood before it, trembling but determined. What do you want? She whispered. Her reflection stared back, still grinning, its mouth slowly beginning to move. I want out. Before Clara could react, the mirror began to ripple like water. The reflection stepped forward, pressing its hands against the glass. Clara stumbled back, horror washing over her as her reflection started to push through the barrier. No! She screamed, turning to run, but it was too late. The glass shattered and her reflection was free. 
Shards of the broken mirror scattered across the attic floor, and Clara fell to her knees, paralyzed with terror. Slowly, she looked up. Her reflection, or what had once been her reflection, now stood before her, grinning that twisted grin. But the worst part wasn't that the reflection had come to life. No, the worst part was when Clara realized she was no longer in the attic at all. She was inside the mirror. Her breath caught in her throat as she banged against the glass, screaming, but no sound escaped. On the other side, her double looked back at her, still grinning. It turned and walked out of the attic, leaving Clara trapped in the world of reflections where everything was twisted and wrong. From her prison, Clara watched helplessly as her reflection, now pretending to be her, moved through her life, speaking with her voice, walking in her skin. Her parents didn't notice. No one noticed. But Clara knew. She knew that whatever was now in her place would never leave, and no one would ever know the real Clara was gone. And as the years passed, Clara remained trapped in the world behind the glass, her only company, the shattered mirror reflections, each one grinning back at her forever. Story number six. Patient vanishes again. Dr. Emma Calloway stood before the stark metal door, the words Ward 6, restricted access, glistening under the dim fluorescent light. Her hand trembled slightly as she held the clipboard close to her chest. She had heard the stories about Ward 6. Everyone had. But now, after years of skepticism, she was about to witness it herself. The hospital was quiet. Too quiet, she thought. It was a silence that wrapped around the halls like a damp fog, thick and suffocating. She glanced down at the chart. The name at the top was familiar to every staff member at Newbriar Psychiatric Hospital, Jacob Reeves, the infamous patient 13. He had, he had been admitted nearly a decade ago after a brutal incident in which he'd attacked his family. The police found him standing in the middle of the living room, his hands covered in blood, but his eyes hollow, vacant. He didn't say a word during the investigation. No motive, no explanation, just silence. He was sentenced to New Briar, diagnosed with severe psychosis. Over the years, strange things happened with Jacob. He would disappear from his locked room only to be found later, wandering the grounds or sitting in the cafeteria as if nothing was out of place. No one ever figured out how he escaped. And then two years ago, he vanished entirely. No trace of him anywhere in the hospital. The police conducted a search, the hospital was under investigation, and nothing was found. Until last night, Jacob Reeves had reappeared in his old room. Dr. Calloway? A voice interrupted her thoughts. It was Tim, one of the orderlies. His usually confident face was pale, eyes wide with unease. Yes, Tim, she replied, keeping her voice steady. Are you sure you want to do this alone? He asked, glancing nervously at the door. I mean, after everything. I need to assess him she said, more firmly than she felt. We need answers. Tim nodded, though he looked like he wanted to argue. Instead, he unlocked the door and stepped aside. She gave him a reassuring nod and entered the room, the door closing softly behind her. The room was sparse, just a bed, a chair, and a small window with bars. Jacob sat on the bed, his back to her, staring out at the darkening sky. His posture was relaxed, almost too relaxed, as if the years of madness hadn't touched him. Mr. Reeves, Emma began, her voice gentle but authoritative. She took a step closer. Jacob? Slowly, he turned his head toward her. His face was gaunt, his eyes sunken but calm, too calm. The kind of calm that prickled her skin. There was something unsettling about his gaze, something she couldn't quite place. I was wondering when they'd send you, he said, his voice low but clear. Emma's heart skipped a beat. You remember me? You've been watching me for years. Jacob said, his lips curling into a faint, eerie smile. I remember everyone. Emma swallowed hard, trying to maintain her composure. Jacob, you disappeared two years ago. Where have you been? His eyes flickered with something. Recognition? Amusement? It was hard to tell. They took me away, but I came back. I always come back. Who are they? She pressed, edging closer to his bed. Jacob turned fully to face her now. His skin was pale, almost translucent, and there was a strange sheen to it. They live in the walls, he whispered, his voice barely audible. They watch, they listen, and when they're ready, they take you. A chill crawled down her spine, but she kept her tone measured. Jacob, I need you to focus. How did you disappear from a locked room? He chuckled softly, the sound echoing unnervingly in the small space. The room was never locked for me. 
Emma felt a rising sense of dread. Something was wrong. Very wrong. She glanced around the room, half expecting to see shadows moving in the corners. Tell me, doctor, Jacob continued, his smile widening. Do you ever feel like you're being watched? Emma froze. The air in the room felt heavier, thicker. Her pulse quickened. She had always brushed off the strange feelings in Ward 6. The sensation of unseen eyes, the occasional flicker of movement just out of view, as nothing more than overactive nerves. But now, with Jacob sitting there smiling that unnerving smile, the feeling was almost unbearable. I see them, you know, Jacob said, his voice barely a whisper. They've been watching you, too. She stepped back, her breath coming faster. Jacob, we need to. Before she could finish, the lights flickered. Once, twice. And then they went out, plunging the room into darkness. Emma's heart pounded in her chest. She fumbled for her flashlight, her fingers trembling as she clicked it on. The beam cut through the darkness, illuminating the bed. Jacob was gone. Panic surged through her. She spun around, the flashlight's beam darting across the room. The door was still closed, locked. There was no possible way he could have left, but he was gone, just like before. Emma's breath hitched. She backed up toward the door, her mind racing. This wasn't possible. None of this made sense. Then she heard it, a soft scratching sound. It was faint, but it was there, coming from behind the walls. Her blood ran cold. Slowly, she turned the flashlight toward the wall next to the bed. The scratching grew louder, more frantic, and then in the narrow beam of light, she saw it, a pair of eyes staring back at her from within the wall. Emma screamed, stumbling back. The scratching intensified, filling the room with a cacophony of noise. The walls seemed to pulse to shift. The eyes blinked, and then they were gone. Silence fell again. The door burst open, and Tim rushed in, his face pale with fear. Dr. Calloway, are you okay? Emma stood there, shaking, her mind struggling to process what had just happened. She looked around the room. Jacob's bed was empty. The walls were still. He's gone, she whispered, her voice trembling. Jacob Reeves, he's gone again. But this time, she wasn't sure he'd be the only one. Story number seven. Nurse's ghost shift. The night shift at Red Willow Hospital was never busy, but it was never calm either. Being an old building nestled on the outskirts of town, it had its share of stories. The long, echoing corridors and flickering lights had spooked many nurses, but none so much as Evelyn. She'd worked the graveyard shift for three years, each night growing stranger than the last. The hospital was quieter than usual. Evelyn stood at the nurse's station, flipping through patient charts, her fingers trembling slightly. There was something unsettling in the air tonight, more than just the usual eerie stillness. A faint, cold draft seemed to drift through the hallways, though none of the windows were open. Everything okay, Evie? asked Michelle, her only companion on the shift as she stretched in her chair. Yeah, Evelyn replied, glancing down the hall. Just, it feels weird tonight. Do you feel that? Michelle shrugged. Every night feels weird here. It's probably just your mind playing tricks on you again. Evelyn forced a smile. Michelle wasn't wrong. Red Willow had that effect on people, but something gnawed at her, something she couldn't shake. A distant sound, faint but unmistakable, reached her ears. A soft hum, like a lullaby. Do you hear that? Evelyn asked, standing up abruptly. Michelle frowned, listening intently. I don't hear anything. Evelyn hesitated for a moment, then shook her head. Maybe it was just her imagination. The silence resumed, but the chill in the air intensified. The clock ticked past midnight, and the sense of unease grew heavier. I'm going to check on the patients, Evelyn said, needing to move to shake off the growing dread. She wandered down the dimly lit corridors, peeking into rooms, making sure everyone was resting peacefully. The patients were quiet, their soft snores the only sound breaking the eerie stillness. But as she reached room 306, Evelyn stopped dead in her tracks. The door was ajar. No one should have been in that room. It had been vacant for months ever since Mrs. Harris, a long-term patient, passed away unexpectedly during one of Evelyn's shifts. The death was ruled natural, but the memory of Mrs. Harris's last moments still haunted her. Evelyn pushed the door open slowly, the hinges creaking ominously. The room was dark, except for the faint glow of the moon through the window. She stepped inside cautiously, her heart racing. Suddenly, a figure shifted in the bed. Evelyn froze. There was someone lying there, curled under the covers, just like Mrs. Harris had been. Michelle? 
Evelyn whispered, hoping her colleague was playing a prank. No response. The figure moved slightly again, and Evelyn could hear shallow breathing, the kind that came from someone who was barely clinging to life. The room grew colder, and the hair on the back of Evelyn's neck stood on end. She approached the bed, her hands shaking. Ma'am? Ma'am? She asked, her voice barely above a whisper. The figure shifted, and slowly, agonizingly, a pale, wrinkled hand slid out from under the blanket. Evelyn gasped, stepping back as she recognized the hand. It was just like Mrs. Harris's, skeletal and cold. Before she could react, the figure sat up in the bed, revealing the face of Mrs. Harris. Her skin was sallow and translucent, her eyes wide with a vacant stare. She looked at Evelyn, lips trembling as if she were about to speak. But she didn't say a word. Evelyn stumbled backward, her mind racing. It couldn't be Mrs. Harris. She was dead. They had cleared out the room, removed all traces of her. Yet, here she was, sitting in the bed as if she had never left. You shouldn't be here, Evelyn stammered, panic rising in her chest. She turned to run, but found the door had closed behind her. A cold breeze swept through the room, and the humming began again, this time louder, more insistent. The lullaby that Mrs. Harris had always hummed to herself at night. Evelyn's back hit the door, her breath coming in shallow gasps. Mrs. Harris stood from the bed, her frail body moving unnaturally, as if her joints weren't fully connected. She began to shuffle toward Evelyn, her eyes locked onto her with an eerie, unblinking stare. You left me. A faint whisper echoed in Evelyn's ears, though Mrs. Harris's mouth didn't move. Evelyn squeezed her eyes shut, praying this was just a nightmare, some twisted vision brought on by exhaustion. But the coldness pressing against her chest was real. The sound of her own heartbeat thundering in her ears was undeniable. Suddenly, the door swung open and Evelyn stumbled into the hallway, gasping for air. Michelle was standing there, looking confused and concerned. Evie, what's wrong? I, I saw her! Mrs. Harris! She's in there! Evelyn gasped, pointing to the room. Michelle frowned, stepping inside. She flicked on the light. The bed was empty. There's no one here, Michelle said softly, glancing around the room. No, she was there. I saw her. Evelyn's voice was shaky. Michelle put a hand on her shoulder. You've been working too hard. You need a break. Evelyn shook her head, trying to make sense of what she had just seen. She could still feel the chill in the air, still hear the faint echo of that haunting lullaby. As they left the room, Evelyn cast one last glance over her shoulder. The air was still, the bed neatly made, as if no one had ever been there. But as they walked down the corridor, the lights flickered, and a soft hum floated through the air once more. Two weeks later, Evelyn had handed in her resignation. She couldn't bear to return to the night shift after what happened, but she couldn't escape the memories either. One evening, while packing up her locker, she found something odd in her jacket pocket. It was an old photograph. Frowning, she pulled it out. It was a group photo of nurses from the 1960s. There, standing in the middle, was a young woman, her face hauntingly familiar. She had the same vacant eyes, the same skeletal hands as Mrs. Harris. But it wasn't a patient. It was Evelyn. Suddenly, she realized the truth. Her shift had never really ended. Story number eight. Never-ending night. It was a cold, moonless night when Lily found herself driving along a desolate country road. Her headlights barely penetrated the thick, suffocating darkness, and the winding path seemed endless, as if leading her nowhere. The trees stood like silent sentinels, their gnarled branches twisting toward the sky. She gripped the steering wheel tighter. The only sound accompanying her was the hum of the engine and the rhythmic thud of the tires over the uneven road. Lily hadn't planned on being out so late. A few hours earlier, she had attended a small family gathering in a town about two hours from home. The laughter and warmth had kept her longer than intended, and now she regretted not leaving sooner. The GPS was her only lifeline, yet even it seemed confused, recalculating the route over and over, guiding her deeper into this isolated stretch of road. Suddenly the engine coughed and sputtered before dying completely. Panic surged through Lily as her car rolled to a halt. She sat in stunned silence, the oppressive quiet seeping into the vehicle. The dashboard lights blinked out, leaving her in total darkness. She fumbled for her phone, but there was no signal. Lily's breath quickened. This can't be happening, she muttered to herself, trying to calm her racing heart. She popped the hood, grabbed a flashlight from the glove compartment, 
and stepped out into the freezing night air. Her footsteps crunched on the gravel as she made her way to the front of the car. The flashlight beam flickered weakly over the engine, and she realized she had no idea what she was looking at. Mechanic work was beyond her knowledge, but she figured jiggling some wires or checking the battery might help. As she leaned over the engine, she caught movement from the corner of her eye. She froze, turning the flashlight toward the trees. The beam swept through the forest, but nothing moved. The wind rustled the leaves, but otherwise the woods were eerily still. With a shaky breath, she turned back to the engine. Just as she reached out to check the battery connections, she heard it. A soft whisper carried on the wind. Lie. Lie. Her blood ran cold. She spun around, heart hammering, but no one was there. The trees loomed large, their shadows curling like skeletal fingers. She told herself it was just her imagination, that the darkness was playing tricks on her. But the whisper came again, closer this time. Lee! She clutched the flashlight like a weapon, backing toward the car. Who's there? She called, her voice trembling. Silence. Only the steady rustle of the trees answered. Fighting the urge to scream, she climbed back into the car, locking the doors. Her heart pounded against her ribs as she glanced in the rearview mirror, half expecting to see someone or something lurking behind her. But the back seat was empty. A cold sweat broke out on her forehead as she tried to start the engine again. It sputtered, then went dead. She tried once more, but nothing. Frustration and fear coiled inside her. She was stuck here, in the middle of nowhere, with no signal and no way to get help. Just as she was about to try again, a figure appeared in the road ahead, a tall, shadowy silhouette standing unnervingly still. Lily's breath hitched. She rubbed her eyes, thinking it must be a trick of the darkness. But no, the figure remained, motionless, about twenty feet ahead, facing her. It didn't move, didn't breathe. She could make out no features, just the vague outline of a person. A chill swept over her, and she reached for her phone again, but the screen still showed no service. She pressed her hand to her mouth, trying to stifle the rising panic. What did they want? Why were they just standing there? As if in answer, the figure began to move, slowly, deliberately, toward her car. It moved un unnaturally, its body jerking and twitching with each step. Terror took over. Lily turned the key in the ignition again, desperate now, and miraculously, the engine roared to life. Without thinking, she slammed on the gas. The tires screeched as the car lurched forward. She kept her eyes straight ahead, heart racing as she sped past where the figure had stood. But as she looked in the rearview mirror, her blood turned to ice. The figure was gone. She exhaled shakily, trying to rationalize what had just happened. Maybe it was some deranged hitchhiker, or maybe her mind was playing tricks on her in the dark. But then the whisper returned, louder this time, filling the car. Lee, Lee. Her skin crawled. She glanced in the rearview mirror again, and her stomach dropped. In the back seat, seated calmly as if they'd always been there, was the figure. Its face was a blank, featureless mask of smooth skin. No eyes, no mouth, just the outline of a head sitting unnaturally still. Lily screamed, veering off the road. The car crashed into a ditch, throwing her violently against the steering wheel. Dazed and bleeding, she struggled to regain her senses. The figure hadn't moved. It sat there as if waiting. Trembling, she unbuckled her seatbelt and scrambled out of the car, ignoring the pain shooting through her body. She stumbled into the woods, leaves crunching beneath her feet as she ran deeper into the darkness. Behind her, she could hear the sound of footsteps, slow and deliberate, following her. The whisper grew louder, echoing in her mind. Lily, you can't run. Her legs burned, but she didn't stop. She couldn't stop. Not until she was safe. But no matter how far she ran, the footsteps remained close behind as if the figure was always just a few paces away. Suddenly she burst into a clearing. The moon, hidden until now, shone brightly overhead, casting long shadows across the ground. But something was wrong. She froze. Ahead of her, parked in the middle of the clearing, was her car, smashed exactly as she had left it. And sitting inside, staring straight at her through the windshield, was the figure. It smiled. But this time it had a face, and it was her own. Uh. In the never-ending night, Lily was trapped, a figure in the dark, running in circles, always trying to escape herself. But in this place, escape was impossible, because some nights never end. Story number nine. Vanished Guard Returns. 
It was a quiet night in the small, sleepy town of Maple Hollow. The moon hung high, casting pale light over the streets, creating long, eerie shadows that seemed to dance with the wind. The old asylum, just outside of town, stood silent against the night, its decaying walls a testament to time. Once a grand institution for the mentally ill, it was now abandoned, closed after a series of mysterious disappearances decades ago. The local legend spoke of strange occurrences surrounding the asylum. People claimed to hear voices echoing through the halls, even though it had been empty for years. No one dared go near it except for a lone guard, a man named Travis, tasked with keeping an eye on the decrepit building. Travis had been working the night shift for three years. Every night he would make his rounds around the perimeter of the asylum, checking for trespassers. Nothing exciting ever happened, but despite the uneventful routine, Travis found the place unnerving. The asylum's towering silhouette seemed to watch him every time he walked by, and the windows, long since shattered, gave the building an ominous, hollow stare. One chilly autumn night, however, Travis didn't come home. His wife Sarah became worried when dawn arrived and he hadn't returned. She called the local authorities, but their search revealed nothing. His car was still parked outside the asylum, but there was no sign of Travis anywhere. The only trace left behind was his flashlight, lying discarded near the front gates. It was as if he had vanished into thin air. For weeks, the town buzzed with rumors. Some said Travis had abandoned his family. Others whispered about the asylum's dark past, that perhaps the building had claimed yet another soul. Eventually, the search efforts were called off, and Travis was presumed dead. A year later, on the anniversary of his disappearance, something strange happened. A young woman named Emma, newly appointed as the night guard in place of Travis, arrived at the asylum. She had heard the stories, but she wasn't one to believe in ghost tales. To her, it was just another job, albeit one with a creepy backdrop. As she walked the perimeter on her first night, the cold wind howling through the broken windows, she felt a strange sensation, like she was being watched. Shrugging off the unease, Emma continued her patrol. Hours passed without incident. It was just after midnight when she heard the faint sound of footsteps behind her. She spun around, but no one was there. The hair on the back of her neck stood up, she decided to check inside the asylum, figuring it might be a group of local kids sneaking in. The asylum's front doors creaked loudly as she pushed them open, the noise reverberating through the empty halls. Dust swirled in the moonlight that filtered through the cracked windows. Emma swept her flashlight across the decaying walls, her boots echoing with every step. She paused when she reached a door marked security. She reached for the handle, hesitating for a moment before pushing it open. Inside, the room was just as empty and dilapidated as the rest of the building, except for one thing, a guard uniform, neatly folded on the desk. Emma's brow furrowed. She took a step forward, her eyes locked on the name tag that was still pinned to the shirt. It read, Travis. Her pulse quickened. She remembered hearing about him, the guard who had disappeared without a trace. She approached the desk, her heart pounding in her chest. As she reached for the uniform, a loud bang echoed down the hallway. Emma froze, her flashlight beam shaking slightly in her hands. The sound came again, louder this time. She stepped out of the room, scanning the hallway. Hello? She called out, her voice shaky. Is anyone there? There was no answer. The footsteps began again, slow, deliberate. They were coming from upstairs. Emma swallowed hard, her legs feeling like lead as she ascended the staircase. Every step felt heavier than the last. When she reached the top, she found herself in a long corridor, the air thick with dust and decay. At the end of the hallway, she saw him. A man stood there, facing away from her. He was wearing a guard uniform, his posture rigid. Travis? Emma whispered, her voice barely audible. The figure didn't move. Emma slowly approached him, her footsteps silent on the cracked floor. Travis? She repeated, louder this time. The man turned around. Emma gasped. His face was pale, his eyes sunken and hollow. It was Travis, but something was wrong. His skin was unnaturally cold and lifeless, and his lips moved soundlessly as if trying to speak but unable to form the words. Emma took a step back, her mind racing. This wasn't possible. Travis had been gone for a year. There was no way he could still be alive. And yet, here he was. 
Suddenly, Travis lifted his hand, pointing down the hallway. His mouth opened, but the only sound that came out was a low, guttural moan. Emma's blood ran cold as she realized what he was trying to show her. At the end of the hallway, a door slowly creaked open, revealing a room beyond. The stench of decay wafted toward her, and she knew, deep down, that something terrible was inside. But before she could react, Travis lurched forward, his hand grabbing her arm with a strength she hadn't anticipated. His eyes were filled with desperation, as if trying to warn her, trying to tell her to leave. Emma yanked her arm free and bolted down the stairs, her heart hammering in her chest. She didn't stop until she was outside, gasping for air. She turned back to look at the asylum, expecting to see Travis at the door, but there was no one. She never went back. A week later, authorities investigated and found something disturbing. In the room at the end of the hallway, they uncovered a hidden basement. Inside, they found bones, many bones, some dating back decades. Among them was a newly added body wearing the same uniform Emma had seen. It was Travis, dead for months. Story number 10. Night Janitor Missing. The old Burlington High School stood at the edge of town, a towering relic of brick and ivy. Built in the 1930s, it had seen generations pass through its doors. But there was something unsettling about the building after dark. The fluorescent lights hummed eerily, casting long shadows in the empty hallways. The janitors who worked the night shift were the only souls who ever stayed long enough to experience its true nature. Eddie was one of those janitors. A middle-aged man with thinning hair and tired eyes, he had been working at Burlington High for over a decade. Most of his colleagues had left after a few years, claiming that something wasn't right about the place, but Eddie didn't believe in ghost stories. He had a job to do and bills to pay. The high school was quiet, and for the most part, the kids were respectful enough not to make too much of a mess. He preferred the night shift. It was peaceful and no one bothered him. That is, until George disappeared. George was another janitor, a few years younger than Eddie, with a loud laugh and an infectious smile. One night, a week ago, George had vanished. He hadn't shown up for work and no one had seen him since. His truck was still parked in the school lot, keys dangling from the ignition. The police had come, questioned a few people, but no leads had surfaced. Eddie was one of the last people to see him alive. George had been covering the East Wing that night, same as always, and everything had seemed normal. Uh, but now George was gone. The school had hired a new janitor to replace him, a skinny kid named Jake. He was fresh out of high school himself and eager to prove himself. He followed Eddie around like a shadow, asking questions about the job, the hours, the routines. Eddie didn't mind, but he could tell Jake was spooked by the stories about George's disappearance. You think something happened to him here? Jake asked one night as they worked side by side in the dimly lit hallway. Eddie shrugged. Could be anything. Maybe he just took off. People do that sometimes. Yeah, but leaving his truck? His phone? Eddie didn't have an answer for that. He didn't want to speculate. It wasn't his place. Besides, there were always rumors about Burlington High. People said it was haunted. That strange things happened when the lights went out, we'd have, but Eddie had never seen anything himself. He wasn't about to start jumping at shadows. That night, Eddie assigned Jake to the East Wing, George's old route. The kid didn't seem thrilled about it, but he didn't argue. Eddie watched him head down the long corridor, mop in hand, before turning back to his own duties. Hours passed. The school was as silent as a tomb, the only sounds the occasional creak of old wood or the faint hum of the air conditioning. Eddie finished mopping the gymnasium floor and checked his watch. Jake should have been done by now. Eddie pulled out his walkie-talkie. Jake, you finished over there? Static. He waited a moment, then tried again. Jake, you there? More static. A cold feeling crept up Eddie's spine. He set down his mop and headed toward the east wing. The hallway stretched out before him, dark and endless. The fluorescent lights flickered overhead, casting eerie shadows that danced across the walls. He called out Jake's name, but there was no response. When he reached the janitor's closet at the end of the corridor, the door was slightly ajar. Eddie pushed it open and stepped inside. The room was empty, save for a mop bucket and a few cleaning supplies. Jake's jacket was draped over a chair, but there was no sign of the young janitor. Eddie frowned. Maybe the kid had gotten spooked and left early. He turned to leave, 
But something caught his eye, a faint glow coming from the corner of the room. It was George's flashlight. Eddie's pulse quickened. He picked up the flashlight and examined it. It was covered in dust like it had been there for days. How had no one noticed it before? A chill ran down his spine as he realized something else. The closet felt colder than it should, much colder. His breath misted in the air as he stood there, frozen in place. Then he heard it, a faint sound like whispering. Eddie spun around, heart pounding in his chest. The whispers grew louder, more insistent. They seemed to be coming from behind the wall, from somewhere deep within the school. He stumbled back, his hand brushing against the wall. To his surprise, it moved. A hidden door. It creaked open, revealing a narrow staircase leading down into darkness. Eddie hesitated for only a moment before descending. The stairs were steep, the air growing colder with each step. At the bottom, he found himself in a long, narrow tunnel that seemed to stretch on forever. The whispers were louder now, echoing off the walls. He followed the sound, flashlight flickering as he walked. The tunnel twisted and turned until finally it opened up into a small windowless room. And there, in the middle of the room, was George. He was sitting on the floor, his back against the wall, staring blankly ahead. His clothes were dirty, his skin pale and clammy. Next to him, slumped over, was Jake. Eddie rushed to them, shaking George's shoulders. George, what happened? What the hell is going on? George turned his head slowly, his eyes empty and hollow. I couldn't leave, he whispered. None of us can leave. Before Eddie could react, the door to the room slammed shut. The whispers grew louder, filling his head with a cacophony of voices. And then he saw them, shadows creeping along the walls, their forms twisting and writhing. They weren't human. They were something else, something ancient, something hungry. Eddie backed away, but there was nowhere to go. The shadows closed in, their cold fingers brushing against his skin. As the darkness swallowed him, he finally understood. No one ever left Burlington High after dark, and now Eddie wouldn't either. The next morning, the principal found the janitor's closet door ajar. Both Eddie and Jake were missing. The police searched, but found no trace of them. Just like George, they had vanished without a trace.